What is an anemic domain model and why is it considered an anti-pattern? We're going to compare an anemic to a rich domain model and we're going to see what are the differences between the two. Here we have an anemic domain model in the order entity and let's first try to explain what an anemic domain model is and then we're going to discuss why it is considered an anti-pattern. We say that the order class is anemic because it's pretty much treated as a data model. All it contains are properties for the various values that an order should hold, such as the ID, the customer ID, a list of line items, and an order status. Another telltale sign of an anemic domain model is the presence of public setters. What this tells us is that any logic related to the order class is implemented somewhere else, probably in an application or a domain service, this is generally problematic to maintain over time as you're going to end up with many places in the code referencing this property, which means that the order status setter, for example, is going to be referenced in a few places in the code. And whenever we want to introduce some additional behavior around this order status, we need to change those relevant pieces of code. And that is difficult to maintain as our application keeps growing. Another big problem with public setters is when you have navigation properties or collection navigations, such as line items in this example. What is preventing someone to obtain an instance of an order and then freely add or remove line items to the order? Well, nothing is preventing you from doing something like this with the order's line items. And this is again another issue with the anemic domain model. Let's say that the logic for adding a line item to the order is complex. We have a few calculations to do before we can place a new line item. You can quickly see how this is going to be duplicated in our code base if we have a few flows in our application that are adding line items to the order. And now imagine that a new request comes in where we have to support discounts for certain products that are added to the line item. Where are you going to implement this logic if it is scattered all over the code base? This is again where an anemic domain model falls short and it would be much more beneficial if that logic was encapsulated inside of the order class. Let's take a look at another anemic domain model, such as the product. You can see the same pattern repeated again. No behavior is present on our product and we have a lot of properties just containing primitive types making the product entity pretty much a data model. Of course, we have public setters, which means that the logic related to products, for example, for price and currency, resides somewhere else in our code. So let's see an example of how an anemic domain model is typically used in some sort of application or domain service. I'm going to show you an example of an order service, which contains methods for creating an order and adding a new line item. So you can see the order service has two dependencies, the order repository and the unit of work. This can also be replaced with EFCore's database context if you don't want to work with repositories and units of work. Let's see what the create method looks like. You can see that it has one argument, which is the customer for which the order is created. And then we invoke the parameterless constructor on the order entity to create a new order and we set the ID, the customer ID, and we set the status to pending. We can definitely say that this line of code here, where we set the status of a newly created order is part of our domain logic. If we ever wanted to change this, we would have to go back to the order service. And this becomes even more problematic to maintain if we have a few places in our code creating an order. It would have been much better if the logic of creating an order was inside of the order class. That way we can easily maintain which status is set when an order is created. This is your typical use of an anemic domain model. And it's very common in CRUD applications, which is not so problematic, but it's problematic in applications that have very rich domain logic. Let's take a look at one more example of adding a line item to the order. So this is the method here in our order service. It accepts an order ID and a product. 
and it's supposed to create a new line item and add it to the list of line items on the order. You can see the standard first step of fetching the order. Then we create a new line item by calling the parameterless constructor on the line item and we set each of the properties one by one. And then after creating a line item instance, we append it to the line items list on the order. I mentioned why this is problematic because nothing is controlling the list of line items. Anyone can freely add or remove elements from this list because it's not encapsulated in any way. Before I discuss how the rich domain model would look like, first I'm going to need you to smash that like button and definitely subscribe to my channel. And I wanted to mention what are the actual benefits of designing your domain models like this, making them anemic on purpose. One very big benefit is it's very easy to work with. If all your setters are public, then I can just write whatever code I need that's going to compile and I have a working implementation. I commonly use this approach in simple CRUD applications with very little or no business logic present. It makes no sense to design a rich domain model for an application like that because it's only going to slow you down. Having said that, let's consider what a rich domain model would look like for the same domain. At first sight, this is not a significant difference from the anemic domain model but let's see what we have. So first off, the setters are no longer public. All of them are now private. And if anyone wants to make changes to the product, we would have to expose methods on the product class to allow for these properties to change. So we are encapsulating modifications on this class inside of the class's methods. Another thing is the introduction of value objects to encapsulate some complex types, such as the price with a money value object and the SKU value object containing some logic for constructing a valid SKU. So this is actually a record because we want our value object to be immutable and have structural equality. And we have a factory method for creating a valid SKU with some logic inside. So now we have moved our domain logic into the domain layer, which is a sign of a rich domain model. This is going to be more apparent in the order entity. So first off, we no longer have a public parameterless constructor, but we have a private one. And you can see here a static factory method, which is the order create method, which encapsulates the logic for creating an order. Also, the line items are no longer publicly exposed. They are contained inside of a private read-only field inside of the order class, which now controls which line items are added or removed from an order. Let's see how the order create method looks like. You see that now the order creation is moved inside of the order class. Even though we're still setting the properties manually, we can do that because the setters are private and we have access to them inside of the order class. But outside of the order entity, you can't set these values because the setters are now private. And also the setting of the order status to pending when an order is created is encapsulated inside of the static factory method, which is the order create. And if we ever want to change what the order status is when a new order is created, we only have to do that in one place. And let's take a look at the add line item method. You can see that it accepts a product ID and a money instance representing the line item price. We create a new line item as we did earlier only this time we add it to the internal collection of line items, which is encapsulated inside of the order entity. And now if anyone wants to add or remove line items on this order, they have to go through the public methods that are exposed on the order entity. If we ever want to introduce additional behavior for adding a new line item, we can safely do that inside of the add line item method. Let's take a look at the rich and the anemic domain models side by side. And now I hope the difference is much more clearer to see. You see that here we have just properties with values and no behavior present. Whereas with the rich domain model, all of the behavior is nicely encapsulated inside of the class itself. If you enjoyed this video, smash that like button. Let me know in the comments what you think about anemic domain models. And until next time, stay awesome.